Bill Gates, who pioneered the personal computer and founded Microsoft, once said, human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. The implications of this statement are quite profound and controversial. It seems as if Mr. Gates is calling things in our cells information and DNA a kind of software program. Most typically think of a computer as something we use to access the internet or to email a friend. However, that's an example of an electronic computer. We also have mechanical and biological computers. The necessary and sufficient components of any functional computer are memory for data storage, an executable program containing instructions for processing data, the processor, which executes the instructions, and the capability to produce meaningful output. Many components of cells are components of real biological computers, equivalent to the components of electronic computers. For instance, DNA and RNA can hold prescriptive information, or algorithms, and proteins can be used to hold, transfer, or process data. Proteins are the output generated by the translation process of a ribosome's computer system. Scientists have also discovered something known as the interactum, which is an incredibly dynamic network used by the cell for internal communication. It's like the Internet of the cell, where proteins, RNA, and DNA can stay in constant communication with each other. We also know there is a cell-to-cell -cell exchange of information integrating our entire body. So, how accurate was Mr. Gates? Well, in 2010, the noted microbiologist Craig Venter and his team accomplished an incredible feat, surpassing their previous accomplishment of determining the complete sequence of the human genome. They created the first computer-designed, synthetically produced genome, which is the set of application programs for an organism. This artificial DNA had over one million letters of genetic code that were then read, processed, and executed by the computer systems in the target cell's nucleus. Thanks to Venter, these biological computers are no longer theoretical, they are experimentally verified. In an interview, Venter stated, life is basically the result of an information process, a software process. Our genetic code is our software and our cells are dynamically, constantly reading that genetic code. When cells were discovered over 300 years ago, it was thought that the structure of a cell was very simple. With the inventions of the electron and proton microscopes, we now have a much clearer understanding of the intricacies of life. The cell is an extremely efficient and well-networked computer system with thousands or even millions of processors and billions of bits of information. Cells are the structural and functional units of all living organisms. Some organisms, such as bacteria, are unicellular, consisting of a single cell. Other organisms, like humans, are multicellular, having many cells. In fact, it's estimated that an adult human has over 100 trillion cells, and each cell is an amazing world of its own. It can take in nutrients, convert the nutrients into energy, carry out specific functions, and reproduce itself as necessary. Even more amazing is that each cell stores its own set of instructions for carrying out each of these activities. Let's take a closer look at how a cell works. The first thing we see is the cell membrane. Much like the firewall software on your computer, the membrane contains protein gatekeepers, allowing only those components into the cell that belong and rejects all other components. Once we pass through this membrane, we see the organelles, or the organs of the cell. Ribosomes are the computer-controlled protein manufacturers of the cell. By fastening to an mRNA and using it as a template, the ribosome arranges amino acids in the correct sequence to form a particular protein. This process is known as translation. Golgi body. Next, we find a Golgi apparatus, also known as a Golgi body. Found in both plant and animal cells, Golgi bodies package and store proteins. Much like a post office, the Golgi packages and labels items, which it then sends to different parts of the cell. It's composed of membrane-bound stacks known as cisternae. Each cisterna is made up of a flattened membrane disc, and its primary job is to modify proteins but it's also involved in the transport of lipids around the cell and the creation of lysosomes. Lysosomes. 
Lysosomes are spherical organelles which dispose of all the waste in the cell. These tiny organelles contain acid hydrolase enzymes that break up waste materials and cellular debris. The membrane around the lysosome allows the digestive enzymes to work at the 4.5 pH they require to break down the debris and dispose of it. Without the lysosomes, the cell would become overwhelmed with debris and ultimately self-destruct. Mitochondria Mitochondria are the power plants of the cell, generating most of the cellular energy known as adenosine triphosphate or ATP. In addition to supplying ATP, mitochondria are involved in a range of other processes such as signaling, cellular differentiation, cell death, the control of the cell cycle and cell growth. Nucleus The nucleus is the control center of a cell. This is where we find most of the DNA which contains the instructions needed to create other elements of the cells. Like the motherboard of a computer controlling its components, the nucleus directs the growth, metabolism and reproduction of the cell, among other things. Life requires fully functional DNA, RNA, ATP, enzymes and other proteins. If any of those components were missing or not working properly, life would fail to exist. This continues to generate several unanswered questions. How could non-living material develop the hardware and software known to be required by all living organisms? How did nature develop the arbitrary protocols for communication and coordination among the thousands of computers in each cell? These kinds of questions lead to interesting discussions among scientists. Those who adhere to a purely naturalistic explanation for the existence of life are left struggling to find mechanisms to create such a sophisticated information source. In any case, the existence of life is indeed a mystery, and it's an exciting topic for discussion, one which should encourage critical thinking. Let's examine what DNA is and how it works to better understand how information is used in the cell. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, is a long polymer of nucleotides, each nucleotide being a deoxyribose sugar molecule, one phosphate group, and one base. Nucleotides are joined together to form the DNA backbone. A second DNA strand then joins the first to form a double helix. You may recognize the code letters A, C, G, and T, which are the four bases used in DNA. These bases are adenine, A, cytosine, C, guanine, G, and thymine, T. Like the code in Mr. Gates' software, the sequence of the four bases encodes genetic instructions used in the development and functioning of all known living organisms. Once organized, this information is what makes up the gene. And genes, as we all know, contain the recipes for the components of life. Genes hold all the information to build and maintain an organism's cells, and they also pass genetic traits to offspring. Human DNA contains an estimated 20 to 25,000 genes in its approximately 3 billion base pairs. And did you know that if the DNA in an adult human's body were laid out end to end, it would be about 30 billion miles long? That's enough to travel the distance from the Earth to the Sun over 320 times. A gene contains both coding sequences that determine what the gene does and non-coding sequences that determine when the gene is active, as well as thousands of other regulatory functions. Less than 2% of the genome is for coding proteins. The other 98%, which used to be thought of as junk DNA, is now being studied to determine its functionality. Chemically, the DNA in, in the cells of my body is the same as that in a fruit fly, an orange, a hippo, an elephant. It's all the same chemically. The uniqueness to all of those species of living things lays in the information content of the DNA. So while the chemistry may be the same, the actual information that's embedded in that chemistry is very, very different. And the challenge 
for molecular biologists such as myself is understanding completely what that information means. When a gene is active, the coding sequence is copied in a process called transcription, producing a messenger RNA or mRNA copy of the gene's information. mRNA is produced by a protein that's over 3,000 amino acids long as it reads the genetic code. Wait a minute. How can messenger RNA require a protein that reads the genetic code, but yet the protein needs the messenger RNA to be produced? Could these have both come into existence at the exact same time with the meaningful information needed for both to operate properly? As you can see, much is still a mystery when it comes to the origin of this complex organic language. And what's fascinating to me, not only do proteins uh, create proteins, but we have proteins that are actually creating the DNA molecule. That's our blueprint. And yet on the DNA molecule, there are sequences of part of the DNA that are coded for those proteins. So the manufacturing plant needs the blueprint, and the blueprint, the DNA, uh, needs the manufacturing plant in order to actually create the DNA. So what came first, the proteins that made the DNA or the DNA that made the proteins? Once DNA is organized into a single coiled piece, it's then wrapped around a complex hierarchical structure of proteins. This is what is commonly known as a chromosome. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes in the human genome. A genome is a full set of chromosomes containing all the inheritable traits of an organism. And as we observe our surroundings, we can see there are many different genomes in existence, creating very unique and incredible organisms. If it seems like your body is constantly working hard, it is. Living organisms continually produce new cells through a process called cell replication throughout their entire lives. And here's how it works. First, we start with our DNA double helix. Helicases are molecular motors that use the chemical energy of ATP to break hydrogen bonds between bases and unwind the DNA double helix into single strands. This process is used for both replication and repair of the strands. If unwound, a single DNA strand would be about six feet in length. And yet, it fits into a cell which can't even be seen with the human eye. Remarkably, these strands are kept from tangling as they are separated and duplicated. Next, these strands are copied by enzyme-based computers, creating an exact replica of each original strand. Over 30 different proteins are required for duplication and repackaging of cellular components during cell division. It's from this tiny, masterfully complex cell that life is formed. All living organisms begin with one cell. As cell division takes place, we see multicellular organisms take form. When we stop to think about our own body having approximately 100 trillion cells, each group having a unique purpose, such as epidermis, the lungs, heart, skeletal structure, muscles, nervous system, digestive system, reproductive system, immune system, and the brain all working simultaneously to form this magnificent machine we call the human body, we begin to have an appreciation for the complexity, elegance, and beauty of life. And as we look around us at the millions of plant and animal species, it becomes incredibly breathtaking to ponder how much information and organization must take place for all of this life to exist. You know, we're all derived from a single cell, the zygote. And what marvels me is from this single cell, we get 250 distinct cell types, each of which has a very, very unique program. All of the cells, with a couple of exceptions, have a nucleus and have a genome. And that genome is the same across all the cells. So when we begin to, to think about the complexity of the genome, I think that's amazingly complex, how we go from a single cell to unique cells 
that have very specific programs of gene expression that are necessary for that unique cell to function. But we're only beginning to understand the information in our genome that directs those unique programs of gene expression.